the Lord impressed on my heart to um, speak to the church about a higher level of consecration. A higher level of consecration. And um, he sent me to the scripture regarding the tabernacle. And, um, and in Exodus chapter 25, uh, God gives direction, and I'll read it very quickly. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1 through to 9. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this again. I did it the first three, but I'll give a brief overview. The scripture reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. This is the offering which ye shall take of them, the gold, the silver, and brass, blue and purple and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skin dyed red, and white skin, and shit of wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall we make it. Amen. Let's just pray for this day. Father, we thank you for the direction that you have given unto us as a fellowship. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will Anoint ears that they might hear. Give us understanding that we might be a people that will show forth your praise. Father, release divine grace upon every soul that we might be edified, that we might understand the principles in the Word of God, that the reality might be realized in our own lives as we walk with you. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, I'm going to ask Sister Eichlin to uh, show for the first slide. What I want to do is to give the church a background as to what the whole teaching is about. Now, last, last week I thought I could get some images up, but the idea is to give you a pictorial overview of what the teaching is going to be about. And I'll go through, I won't teach what I taught last week, it'll take too long, but I'll say some basic things such that we can get a long understanding. Alright, this gives the structure of the tabernacle. And this is what God um, gave the pattern to Moses. And he said to Moses that he must be mindful that he makes the tabernacle after the the plan that God had given to Moses. Um, the idea of the pictorial representation is to give you an understanding of what it kind of looked like. But the purpose of teaching this to our church is for you to increase your level of consecration. I made a statement a couple of weeks ago and I said, the Holy Spirit is not cheap. God is not cheap. And when we get to understand God for who He is, then there will be a, a requirement for us to live a life which reflects the holiness of God, the purity of God, and to give Him a lot of honor. It's important that every person, every member of our church, really appreciate and understand God for who He is. The idea of this um, diagram is to show you the okay can you see this little red dot okay this the first instrument here is the brazen is the brazen altar and the brazen altar was where sacrifices were made this is it has two poles on each end there are four rings and two on the other side it had a nine grade, you'll see that later. This is what I talked about last week. The next furniture is the, the laver. It was also of brass, and this is where the priest would wash. 
there were curtains separating, and this was the doorway into the holy place. In the holy place, you have seven golden candlesticks over here, you have the table of showbread here, and right before the curtain, this was the altar of incense. And after the veil, then this is the Ark of the Covenant, which consists of a golden plate, it was a seal and two angels on top of it. Okay, the next one. Okay, this is just basically the entrance into the Okay, I think my battery is going on this. The entrance into the tabernacle, the first furniture, the brazen altar where the sacrifices no. the sacrifices were offered and the labor for washing. Next slide, please. This gives an insight into what the sacrificial offering was like. That's the bullock. And there are the four horns that I mentioned. The, the animals would be tied to the four horns. The horns were also placed in the Old Testament where you might find mercy. That's the offer being offered upon to God. And that's the label. Next. This is the actual representation of the brazen altar. The brazen altar, this is the grate upon which the flesh, the animal, will be sacrificed. <coughs> um, this was made of brass. It lived inside of there. And then these are the horns. And the whole thing was made of brass. And brass in the scripture is, is indicative of God's judgment. Also to do with this, this represents Calvary. The place of death, the place of sacrifice, and the brazen altar actually represents Calvary, where Jesus died for us. Now the whole idea of going through this is to give you an understanding that when God gave Moses the revelation of the tabernacle, it wasn't just an Old Testament thing. The tabernacle and all its furniture and its practices has a fulfillment in the mosaic economy of worship, it has its fulfillment in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in our Lord Jesus Christ and furthermore it has its fulfillment in the church and we need to see the, rebel, the relevance of all those three areas. The next one please. Here it shows the... This one here is a table of showbread it gives two rows of, uh, of bread and it has staves, it's got crowns on the edges and there are two rows of crowns and that has significance. The altar of incense also had two staves that goes out of it and also had crowns on it and that there's significance to the crowns and that's where the priest would burn incense on a daily basis. And the showbread table is over there without the, the actual bread of it. Next, please. Now, this is the, the brazen labor. And this is what I'll be focusing on today in terms of the teaching. Now, this is where the priest would, walk, would wash. The priest could not go and minister unless the priest washed. Okay, so that's just to give you a pictorial view of what it was like. The next the seven golden candlesticks. The light from the candlestick was actually oil. It wasn't candle, it was just oil. And those heads are basically wells that can actually hold the oil and that's where the, they were lit. Okay, so it was literally oil and that was the only light in the tabernacle. No other light. And that light had to be um, were burning every single day. The light should never go out in the tabernacle. Now this one is the mercy seat and the mercy seat has a number of significant features. One, the cover, which is actually called the mercy seat. If I can do something to point. Okay. 
This is the cover. This is what is called the mercy seat. The two cherubims were over the mercy seat, and where God would speak to the children of Israel was from this area here where there would be a cloud over the mercy seat, and that cloud is referred to as the Shekinah glory of God. And it was through that cloud God would speak. Inside, if you take the lid off the mercy seat, you would have the two tablets of stone, you would have a pot of manna, and you would have Aaron's rod that budded. And that was the place that no man could enter. Now the important thing... Uh, next time. Okay. The purpose of showing you this, this is like a Torah representation, and if you notice, there are camps on either side of the tabernacle. Of significance, when God gave the children of Israel the order in which the twelve tribes should be gathered around the tabernacle, when you look at them in terms of the structure that God ordained, it was made in a perfect cross. Even in the wilderness, the sign of the cross was there as God's redemptive plan, not just for Israel, but for the entire world. So you find at the top, at this area here, um, after, this is where the, after the Holy of Holies, in that area there, three tribes. You had all the tribes of Joseph, Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim. To the left of that tribe, you would have Gad, Simeon, Reuben. To the right, which is in this corner, you would have Dan, Asia, and Naphtali. And to the left, you have the right side, and those are for the Gibeonites. After them, there was Judah, Isaac, and Zebulun. So when God says, make me a tabernacle, that I make me a sanctuary rather, that I may dwell among them, that was the idea. So whenever they journeyed, the, the cloud, uh, or the, that here, the cloud would move, and the priest would blow the trumpet, and the entire people would be ready, get ready to move. They actually lived in tents or booths. So even in one of the feasts called the Feast of the Tabernacles, Sister Claire, you being Jewish, you should understand that. It was they celebrated in booths, in tents to show, um, to bring memory of how they journeyed in the wilderness. Okay, end of slides. Now, what I want to do, the whole purpose of teaching this is to give the church an understanding of the holiness of God such that our lives might be uh, lived in such a way to honor God. I did say the Holy Spirit is not cheap. Everything from God costs something. Now last week I mentioned about the, the, the first furniture, which was the brazen altar. <clears throat> the brazen altar, um, I can, if you could just put it back up, just the brazen altar, the first one. Um, that was made of wood and brass. And the wood is replicated also <clears throat> in, the, in the table of showbread, which I'll come on to you. Now, in this the purpose of this was to show the first approach to God. I know we're all saved, but the understanding is, is that as you go from one part of the tabernacle to the next, you're increasing in glory and you're increasing, you're increasing also in the presence of God. So any sinful man who wants to come to God, you couldn't just come to God. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. God loves you. But the Bible says there is but one God and one mediator between God and man. And that is the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus becomes the mediator. In this case, you have a mediate, a mediate, a mediatorial function in the tabernacle. So if a person wants to come to God, the first furniture that they must come to is the brazen altar. And the brazen altar is significant of a number of things. It's significant of death. Um, brass in the scriptures is significant of judgment. It was the place of death. 
It was where you, if you want to come to God, you cannot by any means find a way around God. And the reason why, God in his holiness could not just accept man because man was impure. And what the tabernacle meant is that God provided a means by which a sinful generation could receive cleansing so that they could have fellowship with the Holy God. And the whole purpose of Jesus Christ's coming is that a sinful world can be cleansed of their sins and enter into fellowship with their Father which is in heaven. I said also that the altar was significant of Calvary. At Calvary, death took place. At Calvary, the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. Um, one of the furnitures that is associated with the, the brazen altar, it had, a, it had a bowl, the basin. The function of the bowl was to catch the blood of the sacrificial animal. It was from that basin that they took hyssop and sprinkled to, for the cleansing of individuals. It also had um, flesh hooks, and so flesh hooks were like sort of fork-like objects that was used to rearrange the sacrifice on the altar. And the concept of flesh hooks is that Jesus' flesh was marred and broken for us. And our understanding is that, is that if you go to God, you can't go to God in, in the flesh. You've got to go to God having died. You've got to approach God having crucified. Your life has to be poured out before God such that He can give you another form of life. Um, other things to, to be said, the horns on the altar were places that were known as places of refuge. When a man would run to the altar to seek refuge, he would hold on to the horns. And if judgment was coming, they might have mercy on him. Now let's move on to the, 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 the next, the next uh, furniture. A few other things I said about the, the brazen altar. I said the fire that lit the brazen altar was, uh, that fire was not lit by any man. When they put the sacrifice together, the fire actually came from the presence of God and lit the sacrifice and consumed it. Now that is important in the scriptures because you see, every church, every church must have fire. And the fire that's in the church must be the fire of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we cannot, you know, I believe that if you're a member of the church of the living God, you must have the Holy Spirit. The priests couldn't function without the Spirit. They couldn't function without fire. And the Holy Spirit is indicative of the fire that came from the presence of God and consumed the sacrifice. When Jesus gave the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, now being exalted at the right hand of God, he received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, which he has shed abroad. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. So you as a believer, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, it means you are lacking in understanding because the whole purpose of this tabernacle was to bring people in the presence of God. And when you are brought into the presence of God, the benefits and all the virtue from God belongs to you. So the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. Okay, now I want to just deal with now the next um, furniture. Now in Exodus chapter 30, the Bible gives us an account of the, 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 the labor of brass. Exodus chapter 30 verse 17 through to 21. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, That shall also make thee a labor of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. 
When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not, and it shall be statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. Now, really important. God says if they don't wash, they will die. Now, why is it so important then that we need to take note? Because in our worship, the whole idea of teaching this to you, in our worship, a believer needs to step through every stage in the tabernacle. A true believer needs to die to themselves so they would have had an experience at the brazen altar. That's where their flesh is taken care of at the brazen altar. That's where blood was shed from Calvary for them that they could enter into fellowship with God. But that's at the brazen altar. Now the next um, furniture is the brazen labor. That's where the washing takes place. First of all, it was also made of brass. And as I said, brass speaks of judgment. How can we talk about judgment when we're talking about going to God? But it's what God wants to judge. God doesn't want to judge the individual. God wants to judge the sin. So the first place, sin had to take care of. So you can call that the born again place. Where we're born again. Sin must be taken care of. Now when it comes to the labor, the labor speaks of the ministry of the word. The ministry of the word. Now Jesus was both a teacher and a preacher. But Jesus spent much time teaching the people. Much time. Because he needed to give them understanding. And the whole purpose of teaching you this is as a church you get an understanding. Now the, the, the ministry of the word was twofold. If we turn to the book of Titus, chapter 3, and in Titus chapter 3, it gives us the first insight into the word. And in Titus, it, 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 the Bible is very specific in how it refers to the word. Titus chapter 3, um, verse 5. But let's read from verse 3 to 5. It says here, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's how we were. That's our past. But after the kindness and love of our God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now God says he saved us, not because we were doing right, but he saved us because of his mercy. And he says, by, and this term, the washing of regeneration. Now let me stop there. When we teach the things about the kingdom of God, the actual purpose of teaching and expo um, an exposition of the word, in the spirit realm, it's referred to as washing. It's referred to as washing. Jesus spoke to his disciples and he said to them, Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. 
So the washing process and to regenerate it means to give life. So we come to Jesus and we were dead in trespasses and sins. So the first thing towards life for us was to hear a word. And so Jesus says, the words I speak unto you, he says they are spirit and they are life. So when you receive the word of God, there is an impartation of life. So when a person who is in sin hears the word, the beginning of their renewal starts with life from the word. And this is why now we need the word. The word gives us direction. The word is an impartation of life into our spirit man and with that God starts the renewal process. So when Titus looked at the condition of man, he said this is what we were like, but we are saved because we received mercy and he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy One. And the agent he used to do that was his word. Okay. Now, it's important that we understand this furniture, going back into the, um, in, into ex, uh, Exodus. Now, turn to Exodus chapter 38 and verse 8. And this scripture is very significant in what it deals with. Exodus chapter 38, verse 8. Okay. It's on the overhead. And he made the labor of brass, and the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses of the woman assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. The purpose of this scripture is to give you the source of the brass. Okay? What they collected was the literal looking glasses. They used polished brass as a mirror. And God says that's what they made the labor out of. Of the brass of the looking glass. Now what is the significance of that? The significance of that is this, is that when you come to the labor, you are coming to a place of judgment. But not judgment because God wants to kill you. The judgment comes as a reflection of what you see. So this is how it works. Why do we use a natural mirror? We use a natural mirror to check ourselves. And ladies, you know about mirrors more than anybody else. And I'm not turning on ladies, but we as people, we need to understand. If you tell me that you live in a house and it doesn't have a mirror, you don't live there, it's not your house. Because you have to know that the here is fixed right, the this is fixed right, and the that is fixed right. So what God did in principle is show you, he says, every man needs to have a look at himself. So then when you buy something and you know it looks good and you fix it up and you get your nice ear cut, you, you know, you say, how do I look? So every man sees a reflection of himself. The purpose of God using mirrors to make the, 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 the brazen labor will you wash. Because as you approach, as you're approaching God, God says, the first thing in your approach is that you need to die. You need to be crucified with Christ. You did that at the brazen altar. You need to be washed in the blood. You did that at the brazen altar. But now that you're born again, you are not perfect. And you need to see yourself for who you really are. So you need to come to the place of washing. And when you come to that place of washing, you will see who you really are. Now that washing is twofold. The first washing is what I'm dealing with is the Word. Unless the Word of 
alcohol is applied to us, we are not clean. Let's turn to the book of James. James chapter 5, no chapter 1, sorry, James chapter 1 and verse 19 onwards. Now Paul is speaking to the believer. And I'm dealing with here of the subject of washing at the labor. And Paul says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, and slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of men worketh not the righteousness of God. Now, this is to say, if you get angry quickly, your anger over a particular situation doesn't work righteousness as far as God is concerned. So he says now, wherefore lay apart or aside all filthiness and superfluity or excess of naughtiness, which means sinfulness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the, of the work. This man shall be blessed in all his deed. Now what God is really saying is that the word of God, he says, is like a mirror. So how does this work? How do you wash yourself? How does it bring judgment to you? This is how it brings judgment. God says in his word that our lips should be clean. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. So the moment you use your own mouth, which is the doorway of your heart, and you speak out of your mouth words which are unacceptable. When you look into the word, the mirror shows you who you really are. Yes, you are born again. Yes, you are under the blood, but your heart needs a lot of attention. So God says, you cannot approach me ultimately to enter into the glory of my presence without taking a look at yourself. Now, if we have an appointment with Her Majesty the Queen, not only do you have a mirror, you can't even dress anyhow. You've got to fix this, fix that, fix that, and then somebody will look at you and they say, you think this is acceptable for Her Majesty the Queen? And so it is, God says, look at yourself, look at your spirit, look at your thinking, look at your thoughts, look at everything concerning in the man, your spirit, soul and body, everything my word touches, look at it. And when you look at it, then you need to come. Only then, and then my word brings a condemnation to your mind. If my word convicts you, fix the conviction. And after you fix the conviction, then you're in a position to take another step closer towards my presence. Are you understanding me? Okay. So then God says now, if we just hear the word and don't do it, He says we are literally like somebody looking in the glass, you see something needs fixing, and all of a sudden you forget what you saw, and what needs fixing remains unfixed. So all we need to do then is to say, God, help me that I not judge myself. You might say, well, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says here in verse 
31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. God expects you to judge yourself on the basis of the word or assess your suitability for his presence. The judgment is not a judgment of condemnation. But if there is condemnation that comes, let me tell you where it comes from. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will bring conviction. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. So if I look at myself using the world as the mirror, and conviction comes to me, that means the Holy Spirit who wants to take me to the eternal presence of God, the Holy Spirit is the one who says, here you are, sister so-and-so, here is a conviction, deal with it. But the basis of this is the Word. So if you say to me, Pastor, I don't know the Word. Well, the Bible says you should. Because it says in 1 Peter, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of God's Word, that you might grow thereby. So the understanding then that is that every believer must have the Word. Does not the scripture says, give us this day our daily bread? The daily bread is twofold. The daily bread is natural bread for your soul, for your physical body. And the daily bread is also spiritual bread for your spirit. That's how we grow when we eat of the word. Now, I want to show you in the scriptures that God is serious about this washing. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 26. Now, for those of you who are married, you would hear the scripture many times. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now what does that mean? It means that husband, you're going to live a sacrificial life for your wife such that she might have a good life just like Christ lived a sacrificial life for the church that he has purchased. And it says here, verse 26, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So if somebody says you need to wash, it is really spiritually talking about the word. So God says the way he's going to sanctify his bride, which is the church, is by the word. He will wash the church by his word. And as he washes us, then we are clean. So now the process of being acceptable to God is not because we speak in tongues. It's not because we are baptized. It's because we have a continuous washing of the word. And that continuous washing, Titus called, is a regeneration. It's a renewing. So in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, um, Scripture just left me. I'll find it. Romans chapter 12. Yes. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now the process of regeneration is a process of renewing. 
So then, what does it mean? It means as young people, you get born again and you're excited about God and you think that all of a sudden everything is fine. Well, it is fine because God has accepted you. But the process of entering into a high dimension in the spirit realm, the process of saying, I'm not just born again. I want to enter into the third dimension of God. I want to live and dwell at the glory. I want to take my position in God. God says, because you're born again, you don't just automatically get there. And the way of illustrating that, he's shown you the tabernacle, the various stages before you enter into the glory. Now, let me show you something. The blood of Jesus is so powerful that the cleansing of the blood when applied means God can sanctify you to, to the infilling of his Holy Spirit. Why I said a couple of weeks ago that the Holy Ghost is not cheap is that what you have is a person who is filled with the Holy Ghost in his human spirit, but mind is not renewed. So the mind is still carnal, but yet we are filled with the eternal spirit of God. And God says the only way the church is going to understand this if you teach them about the tabernacle. And when you teach them about the tabernacle, they will have an understanding of the levels of consecration that is required before you can dwell in the Holy of Holies. Now, Jesus, he's the one who sanctifies us. He is the Word. He is the Logos. He is the Word made flesh. And from Jesus, you get Rima, which is a spoken word. And what God does, whenever he wants to sanctify his church, he uses the Rima. Now, that Jesus is the sanctifier, is evident in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, where the Bible says concerning Jesus, But of him, speaking of the Father, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now the purpose of the wash, washing, is to make us clean. Now, when you receive Jesus, He sanctifies you. He makes you clean. But when you study the subject of sanctification, sanctification is twofold. It's instantaneous and it's also progressive. The means of our sanctification are threefold. The blood that gives you instant sanctification. That means when God applies the blood to you, this is why the devil can't hold you because of the blood. So the scripture says, and they overcame him, that's the devil, by the blood of the Lamb. By the word of their testimonies, they allowed their lives unto the death. So you're sanctified by the blood. And that's an instant sanctification. God cleans you. You're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is holy. And it's because of the blood of Jesus that has power to cleanse us to the utmost degree. Why the Holy Spirit comes in and remains within us because we are sanctified by His blood. And the blood of Jesus is efficacious to sanctify anything that is unclean. So the Holy Spirit, which really is holy, is only there because of the power of the sanctifying blood of Jesus. But the third area of sanctification is when God says now, I need to wash them. I need to change them. I need to change their thinking. I need to change their behavior. The blood of Jesus doesn't do that. The Holy Ghost can tell you no, but you can override it. But if you are a doer of the word, as you do the things that God tells you to do, 1 Thessalonians 
5 and 23, he says, I will pray that your own spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the word of God, in terms of his sanctifying power, affects our spirit, affects our soul, and affects our body. So when Jesus was teaching his disciples, what did he say? He said to them, now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. So what Jesus was doing as the labor, the sanctifier, he saw the condition of the disciples and then he spoke the word. He spoke a rima to wash and to cleanse them. And this is why people were astonished at the ministry of Jesus. Because Jesus was not always just preach, preaching. He was teaching them. And as they were receiving the word, they were leaving the persons clean. Think of the woman who caught in adultery. We might say, well, God just wanted to save her. But when Jesus sent a real word to that woman, and he said to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? He said, none that condemn thee. She goes, no, Lord. He says, neither do I. Go your way and sin no more. The real word, sin no more, entered into her heart. It affected her thinking. And if it affected her heart, it would affect her thinking, it would affect her behavior. That woman was the woman that witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the sanctifier, the brazen one, the one who does all the washing, purified the prostitute to the point that the woman was now holy. The Bible says, such were some of you. So now, under the Old Testament dispensation, you, you, you have an understanding. How is it, boy, why does God talk about this and that and this and that? God is showing principles. And when those principles are applied, and then we see them, we say, oh my God, I'm not where I should be. It's not about the sin. It's not about the clapping of the hands. It's about the condition of the heart. Because we're coming to worship. And we're coming to worship the Holy One. In heaven, they bow before the Holy One. Because they have to be pure. The devil knows this. So this is why you are inundated with unclean thoughts. Because the devil knows that if your thoughts are not right, it doesn't matter how much you speak in tongues, you cannot worship. But Jesus says, come to the labor. Look at yourself. Read my word. It will reflect you. And then you can wash. Okay. Let's give you two biblical examples. Job chapter 42. Job 42, verse 5 and 6. Now, this is where Job had to, he had to repent. Because he thought, you know, God didn't deal with him properly, etc., etc. But Job, listen to what he says. Verse 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. That's God. But now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. What was Job really saying? I've seen thee with my eyes. And as I see your glory, as I see your excellence, as I see your purity, and I look at myself, he says, I abhor myself. I hate, I don't like what I see about myself. Why did Job say that? Because he realized that he was no comparison. He was not fit for the glorious presence of God. Turn to Isaiah. This is why we need washing. Isaiah chapter 6. You know, you know this one. Verse 5 to 7. Okay. Now Isaiah is the prophet. Now don't forget the purpose of me taking through this is 
for you to see the excellency of God's holiness and to reflect on yourself. Now, the Bible says here, verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he, and he said, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. The purpose of that scripture is for when Isaiah, you see, unless you get a revelation of the purity of God, and if you, if you don't get an understanding of how holy God is, you won't see the need to go to that labor. You won't see the need to wash. You've got to have an understanding of who you're having fellowship with. Now the Jews, they understood who they were having fellowship with. Then they could see the pillar of fire by night. They could see the shekinah glory of the cloud of God by day. They knew that he was holy. They heard his voice when they said, none can come up the mountain. Don't let them touch it, lest ye die. So they had an understanding of the purity of God. Now Isaiah the prophet, he saw God, and he saw the glory of God. And the Bible says, in the year that King, in, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Then he looked at himself, he says, woe is me. Until you see God in the fullness of his glory and his essence, you won't look at yourself. Said, my God, I'm in trouble. That's what he's really saying. I'm in trouble. For I, Isaiah, am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. You know what was so good about that? If you check what the scripture says, and then flew one of the seraphims, that's a little job, unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken. With the tongues from off where? Yeah. The altar. Now, brethren, can you tell me which altar that was? There were there are two altars that had fire, natural fire, tongues of fire. <laughs> if you ask me which the, the first one, the brazen altar, that had tongues of fire. The second altar had the, that's the altar of incense that had tongues of fire. If you said to me, where did the angel in heaven, which altar did the angel take it from? It's not the altar of incense. That's where you pray. He took it from the first altar that had to deal with sin, that had to purify the man. So Moses, God told Moses, look, when you make this thing, make sure you make it after the pattern I've shown thee, because the pattern is likened unto the heavenly sanctuary. Where Jesus is the high priest. So the servant swiftly went to the brazen altar in heaven, took some coal, swiftly come back to Isaiah, touched his tongue, and purged him of his sins. And Isaiah felt like he could live again. Brethren, anyone. He 
and the Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? Cleanse him now. He says, by taking heed of thy word. He says, thy word have I hid in my heart, but I might not sin against thee. So the first washing. When you approach the labor made out of material which was a mirror and the significance of that is a place of reflection. Why? You're on a journey. You're going into the presence of God. So you need to stop. And when you look at the labor, you see yourself. God says it's made of brass. That means you need to judge anything that's in your heart, in your thoughts. And you need to have it washed. You need daily bread. You need the word every single day. And let the word wash you and cleanse you. And he says, if the priest ever tried to enter his presence without washing, he will die. Make sure you wash, lest you die. Now, why would they die? Because it means they were still unclean and acceptable for the presence of God. The next aspect of washing is what we are more familiar with, baptism. A lot of people, some people say, no, baptism is not necessary. It's all about God's grace and you just receive grace and you just accept Jesus. You know, sometimes you see this on some of the uh, God Channel programs. You see thousands of people and it says, just, just confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart, confess in your mouth, Jesus is Lord and you're saved. Well, that's true, but it's not the whole picture. The Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You need to be washed. Baptism is a burial. Let me tell you what baptism done. What died at the brazen altar? You died to sin, you died to self. God said, take that dead man. It's the old man. Take that old nature and bury it in water. Bury it. So baptism is a burial, but it's also a washing. When God wanted to save Paul, he sent him to a man called Ananias. And when Ananias spoke to Paul, Ananias said, said to Paul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The New, the New Testament church was a church that gave direct instructions. You need to be washed, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And he says he will give you the Holy Ghost. We should not belittle baptism. It's a process. He says, don't come into my presence unless you follow the process. Can I move on to the showbread? Says that I can. Find me the showbread. Now, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 23. I won't finish this one, but I'll do as much as I can. Verse 23 to 30. Okay. It says here in the scriptures. Just leave the picture up, that's fine. Don't worry about the scripture. It says here, Exodus chapter 25, verse 23 to 25. Now we have completed two areas in the outer court. The brazen altar and the place of washing. Now God gives Moses direction for the shoulder. He says, and thou shalt make a table of shittim wood Two covets shall be the length thereof, and a covet the breadth thereof, and a covet and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make 
unto it a border of an hand breadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about, and thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the stage to bear the table. And thou shalt make the stage of sheeted wood and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and spoons thereof, and cover thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover withal of pure gold shall thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table upon the table children before me always. So bread was supposed to be upon the table always. Now these are the crowns and there's significance to that. And these are the vessels that would go with eating of the showbread and they would come into piles of six. A number of things that can be said about the table of showbread. In the, in the scripture, when it comes to interpreting the scripture, there is what we call for interpretation the first mention principle. And this is the first mention of the word table in the scripture. First mention. And when we understand that why God told Moses, I want you to make a table. A table. The purpose of the table, the table represented a place of communion, a place of fellowship, a place of provision. So God was saying by revelation, this table means I'm going to make some provision for you. Hear me, no man ever entered into God's presence. And God now is saying, you can come in my presence and I'm making all the plans. You see, behind everything that God made in the Mosaic Tabernacle, there are real reasons why we must take note of them. You can't eat from the table of the Lord unless you first die at the brazen altar. And after you die, check your heart. Go and wash. Then you are equipped. Only then are you equipped to eat of the table. The table of God's provision means many things. But I just want to deal with one for the time's sake and I'll deal with the rest next week. One of the things it means is the fellowship and communion. Bread in the scripture represents Jesus. Jesus says, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he says he will never die. So Jesus was the bread of life. The Jews never liked what Jesus said because they said to Jesus, look, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. What do you say? Jesus says, your father ate manna in the wilderness and they died. But I am the true bread. Jesus made a distinction between manna, which is just to sustain you for a while, and true bread, which gives you life eternal. So Jesus, that the show bread represents Jesus. It represents God's provision for a dying, sinful world. It represents God's invitation to a man who would like to know God, but has no means of knowing God. Jesus is the one that he says, if you eat of this bread, if you can come to the place that you can have fellowship with me. Remember when we take communion, the Bible says, and this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he says, he, he took also the cup. When that stop saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So the idea now, God says, Jesus is a daily provision. The showbread was a daily provision for the priest. 
every day they were presented. Now, not only were they children, there were 12. 12 is the number of apostolic government in the Bible. And the 12 showbread represents the 12 tribe of Israel. It represents one government. When God wanted to set up the kingdom, he called 12 disciples, God's government. When he wanted to make the government to represent the church, he called 12 tribes. The 12 tribe represents the church in the wilderness. When he wanted to establish the church, he took 12 disciples, apostolic government and order. Now, the, it doesn't show it here, but the showbread, can you give me 10 minutes? I think it would be good if I could finish on this. The showbread had a pole in the middle. That means it was a circular bread. A circle in the Bible speaks of eternity. It's an eternal provision. Christ is our eternal provision. The fact that it had a hole in the middle can do not like it. shows you that Christ Jesus somehow was bruised. And his provision to us is not a wholesome Christ, it's a bruised Christ. For you and I to get into the presence of God, somebody had to be bruised. You read later that the showbread had to be made of fine flour, not ordinary flour, fine flour. Why fine flour? Because the kernels of wheat had to be crushed, and the crushing of the wheat and the millstone produced fine flour. Fine flour comes out of God's judgment upon the kernel. He judged the kernel, and then Jesus was judged. He was crushed. He was bruised for us that we might eat of his bread. This is why he says, this is my body which is broken for you. Take ye and eat all of it. You cannot enter into that fellowship with Jesus without going to the brazen altar. You cannot enter into that level of fellowship with Jesus without washing yourself. See the reflection of your state. Repent, oh shall repent before God. And then you can come and eat bread daily. It was made of sheet and wood and gold. I said last week sheet and wood speaks of the purity. That wood was used because it was long lasting and it was pure. Gold in the scripture is indicative of deity. It is the di indicative of God's divine order. So God who is divine or Deity speaks of divinity, divine, speaks of God. Now, when they made that altar of gold and of wood, wood in the scriptures represents humanity. Gold in the scriptures represents divinity. So God says the table of showbread is showing Jesus both as man and showing Jesus as God. Jesus is the God man. Jesus is the God that was made flesh. Jesus was perfectly human and Jesus was perfectly God. So the provision was given insight into the ministry of the Son of God. And when you receive, of course, when you receive the Son of God, He brings you into divine order in God. Vessels were also made of gold. They had four corners. The four corners speaks of the four ends of the earth. The message of Jesus Christ must be preached throughout all the world. We might say, well, I never saw it that way. I never saw it that way either. But what I'm beginning to understand is that God is saying, even though it's Old Testament, it has significance for Moses and a form of worship. But the 
greater significance is its representation for the Son of God who was given by God to you. And thereafter, it has significance for us as a church. Everyone must eat. It. Remember, I said to you at the last communion, I wish everyone would have communion, but let every man judge himself. And after you judge yourself, you can eat. And if I said, if a person doesn't eat, you have no place to judge them. Because let me tell you what it's like. Every time we have communion, you know what God does? He says, before you eat, go back to the brazen labor. Check if you need washing. And if you haven't washed, don't eat. Do you understand that point? If there's relevance in all of the tabernacle types, I'd like to conclude by saying this. Um, next week, I want to go on to the seven golden candlesticks. What it means, and what it means for you, what it means for Moses and the mosaic economy, in terms of the worship, what it means concerning Jesus Christ, and what it means to you. Then the altar of incense. And then the following week, if time permits, I will go unto the Ark of the Covenant. Now at the end of this series, let me tell you what you should have. You should have an understanding of divine order. We come every week to worship. Don't just come anyhow. Have an insight of divine order. And then when we come, you know, you can tremble at his presence. I know we've got the blood of Jesus. I know we've got the Holy Ghost. But we are honoring God when we spend enough time washing. He said, don't come unless you wash. And then when we begin